This video is brought to you in collaboration with wowhead.com. Hello everyone. This video right here is going to be very speculative because we don't know a whole lot about this so-called pantheon of death. So don't worry, the title is not an immediate spoiler. This is a lot of Shadowlands alpha information and a bit of speculation. So what is this pantheon of death all about? Well, during an interview, which you can find over at Zoltan TV, an interview with Ian Hastakostas. This was set. Part of what we're going to learn as we go into the Shadowlands is okay. you know, the origins of this place, the relationship between the four rulers of the different realms that we journey to, and their history with the Arbiter and the Jailer. Like how the Shadowlands came to be, just as Azeroth was shaped by the Titans, as we've come to discover, the Shadowlands also were shaped by forces. And so there are connections that tie the different leaders to each other and that's part of this whole new story and this whole universe that we're going to explore so i think i mean i'm, I'm not going to provide any spoilers or specific answers okay. and that's not <laughs> genuinely i'm not confirming that there's a connection but for sure there are parallels between the titan pantheon that rules over our plane of existence and that we've seen in azeroth and and sort of the pantheon of death that has ruled over the Shadowlands. There are parallels there that are going to be fun to explore. A connection between the different leaders, the Arbiter and the Jailer. A so-called Pantheon of Death, parallel to the Titan Pantheon. What we know of the Titans is that they traveled across the cosmos, bringing order to the universe while seeking out more of their kin, slumbering spirits hosted within planets. They then stumbled upon Azeroth, a planet with a spirit inside, but also infected by the old gods. They made it their mission to clean up the planet, transform and shape it to their design, so that the spirits could have a chance at life. Drawing a parallel between the Titans and the Pantheon of Death, one would imagine that they too stumbled or came upon the Shadowlands, a realm that's been around since forever. And if they took similar actions like the Titans have done, then perhaps they also modified and changed the afterlife more than the Shadowlands to fit their design, their ultimate plans, whatever they might be. Now we do know the members of the Titan Pantheon, but who exactly makes up this so-called Pantheon of Death? That's not been mentioned, going by the information shown right now, so disregarding any Pantheons that might show up later. The prime candidates, that would be the ruling bodies of the different realms. In Bastion, this would be the Archon. In Maldraxxus, they have the Primus. Ardenweald has their Winter Queen, Revendreft has Sire the Nephrius, and then potentially there are the Arbiter in Oribus and the Jailer in the Ma. Their function, their realms and organizations, they're quite diverse. In Oribus, high above amidst the swirling vortex of souls that made way to the Shadowlands, there sits the Arbiter. She is the one that lays your soul bare and decides what pocket dimension of the Shadowlands, what realm your soul belongs to. The purpose, a whole lot of the citizens of Oribos like to call it, the purpose of the Arbiter, answering her call, answering her will. In an instant, the judgment is made upon your soul, and your send off, bringing with you a powerful resource, which is called Anima. Anima is a soul's experience, so to say. Good or bad, it doesn't matter. This Anima is what fuels the Shadowlands, fuels its operations, and normally this will be distributed amongst the different realms, but somewhere along the Legion time periods, the machine of death got broken. This could be with pretty much any event in Legion. Perhaps like the opening of the Tomb of Sargeras, or Greymane shattering the Soul Cage, the magical lantern Sylvanas obtained from Helia to try and slay Veyir, or perhaps it was Illidan opening up the rift between Azeroth and Argus, or Sargeras stamina world. That part is uncertain, but its effects are clear. All of that anima is now drawn into the Maw, the domain of the Jailer. This domain is where the Arbiter sends the souls that are considered irredeemable to enjoy an afterlife of torment. When Sylvanas killed herself at the end of Wrath the Lich King, she found herself presumably trapped here, even ran into the spirit of Arthas, but her bargain with the Valkyr, and now, as we know, her allegiance with the Jailer, it got her out of there to set events in motion that brought us to Shadowlands. The Jailer itself is like the boogeyman of the realm. No one ever escapes the Maw once sent in there, so not a whole lot is known about him or the realm. Safe to say, it's, it's not a realm that you want to find yourself in. And now, regardless of what life you've led, regardless of past deeds, this is where the souls end up, which in turn causing quite an anima drought for the other realms. The cause of the droughts and the things going on in the Maw 
Of course, they're not known to everybody, but luckily for them, we are the Mawalkers, the first to escape that hellish domain. While helping them out with their problems and figuring out what is going on, we also learn how these different rulers run their domains and what they're all about. Bastion has the Archon, Kyrestia the Firstborn, the first of the winged Kyrians. It is by the Archon's will that Bastion carries out its purpose. She comes with her paragons, like the paragon of courage, of humility, service, wisdom, purity and loyalty. The souls sent here are those that in life had a natural calling to service in one way or another. Souls, like Ufer the Lightbringer for example, they're sent here to walk the path of the Kyrian and earn their wings. To be a Kyrian means shedding your past burdens and seek virtue through meditation, reflection, but also giving up parts of who we used to be. Those able to successfully earn their wings and join the ranks of the Ascended, they could find themselves with a new job. You could see yourself fulfill a brand new role in the afterlife, like becoming a Valkyr, as this is the place where the original Valkyrs come from. In order to guide those spirits between the living world and the next, one must be without judgments, which is why they're asked to give up their memories of the past, to give up who they used to be, and embrace the will of the Archon. Not all make it though. Rarely, those once bright souls, they fail to complete their rite of passage and they darken. They become lost, wandering the plains of Bastion to lament. They are called the Forsworn, and while at some point it was rare for a blue smurf to become a purple smurf, the anima droughts, as well as the effects of the Jailer, it has more of them turn. More and more wondering why they should let go of who they used to be, if the path of the Archon is actually for them. Even Ufer has become Forsworn, but the last playthrough that we did, it had the details of the Forsworn locked behind the Covenant. The point being that more are wondering if the ruling government of Bastion, if the path of the Kyrian, is truly the way to go. Meldraxxus, that has the Primus, who's been missing for a while now. A master strategist and tactician, he was nearly unbeatable on the field of battle and served as the collective leader of all five of the Necrolords ruling houses. There is the House of Constructs with its ruler Margrave Garmal, the House of Rituals with Margrave Sindane, the House of Plagues with Margrave Stradama, a house in ruins, the House of Eyes with Margrave Akarek, a house in ruins, and the House of the Chosen with Margrave Craxus. The Arbiter will send souls here that are relentless, unyielding, live the life in search and pursuit of power. Not so much about evil or good spirits, but rather strength above all, both inward and outwards, they will find a way here. Examples would be souls like Draka and Lady Vush. This is the heart of the Shadowlands military might, the birthplace of necromantic magic and home to the Necrolord Covenant. Might is right, and with the Primus missing, some of the houses have decided to use their power not in the defense of Shadowlands, they actually want to conquer it. They've assaulted the Bastion, an attack that we help fight back, and we're sent here to figure out what's up in Meldraxxus, why they're on the attack. We team up with the House of the Chosen, the one that's not down with these plans of conquest, and through our adventure, we come across a mysterious room blade hidden inside some stone, left behind crafted even by the Primus. It is our mission to reforge it and gain access to the seat of the Primus, for whoever holds this ancient fortress commands the armies of the Shadowlands. We do just that, place the rune blade in an ancient stone, and while the Primus is missing, we do get a message that needs to make its way to the ruler of Ardenweald. And not just its ruler, also its creator. The Winter Queen stretched out her hands and created this domain. The Tyrannon were amongst the first to grow, digging their roots deep and lifting walls high. They built the groves and were not the only ones who were given this life in the Shadowlands by the Winter Queen. Like the rest of the Shadowlands, Ardenweald is also suffering from the Anima Drought. Once it empowered a cycle of rebirth, spirits connected to nature, they would be sent here by the Arbiter. A spirit like Scenarius, for example, they would spend some time here in Ardenweald, recovering, regrowing, until they were ready to return to the Emerald Dream and eventually Azeroth. That's why Scenarius was able to come back after being slain by Gromar's Hellscream. And it's not just Azeroth spirits of the wild that find a way here, but now with the anima shortage, with their power being low, hard choices need to be made. Choices as to which spirits and groves will be fed the last precious drops of anima, and which will fade away forever. 
that stretches the Winter Queen a little bit thin. So getting an audience with her to pass on the message is a little bit difficult. We fill up our time here, helping out in Arden Weald, dealing with the Night Fae Covenant, until we finally do reach the Queen. The details of the message, they're not entirely shared. She does mention that Arden Weald's anima is barely enough to sustain their groves, let alone contribute to keeping the Banished One held. The news we have brought is troubling. She has used her own power to confront this drought, to save what spirits she could, to spare what worlds she could. More must be diverted to keep the banished one held. And yet, still more anima is needed, more than Arnewield has to spare. Sire Denephrius, he is a master of anima extraction. We are sent into Revendreft with a request to grant what anima he can. Revendreft, a domain not quite as bad as the Ma, but still pretty bad. Sinful souls are sent here by the Arbiter to pay the price for the past deeds. Souls like, for example, kill for Sunstrider. The Venfir, they have the ways of making you pay. Some successfully repent and are offered a new path in the Shadowlands, perhaps even becoming Venfir themselves. While others, they fail and are considered irredeemable, they are sent down into the Maw. Revendreft is made up of seven distinct districts, each presided over by a harvester, a court ruled over by the sire, but when we arrive, something's not quite right. Prince Renafal, once a popular member within the Nafrius court, was the first Venvir crafted by the master's own hand, but all of that changed when the anima dried up. Convinced that his master is behind the drought, he rallied a formidable force to lead the rebellion to succeed Sire Nefrius and make the anima flow once more. He might have been the first, but the other Venvir, they were also created by the Nefrius. Forged from the souls of the redeemed, they were turned into his likeness. Ancient beyond measure, the founder of Revendreft is one of the most powerful beings in all of the Shadowlands. He beseeches Azeroth's champions to help him quell the rebellion that threatens to destroy their way of life. Which means that there are two sides to pick in Revendreft. And as it turns out, Sire Nefrius is actually in league with the Jailer. He's been depriving his people of anima and inflicting a drought upon all of the Shadowlands for some grand purpose. Which is potentially the Jailer, the Banished One breaking out of the Maw, the zone that will be available at max level and is not available for testing quite yet. All we've really seen of it is the Tower of Torgast. Once, the Jailer kept only the most dangerous souls in the cosmos confined in this eternal prison. Now though, some of Azeroth's greatest heroes are trapped here, and we need to rescue them from the Jailer's tower before he expends their very souls. Other secrets live in the tower as well, but they're yet to be revealed. And to be caused into the Ma is to be doomed to a bleak eternity. It is a tumultuous, hopeless land where the vilest souls in the cosmos are imprisoned forever. Should the ancient evil chained here break free, all of reality will be consumed. So, what can we take away from all this information? Well, we know that there's a connection between the different leaders, as the news about the Jailer, the influence of the Ma, it sends us throughout the different zones where they're trying to work together to prevent this. From the acknowledgement of the Archon, to the warnings left behind by the Primus, the Winter Queen, well aware of the Banished One, containing him with Anima, and then Revendreft refusing to offer aid. A parallel with the Pantheon and their ordering of Azeroth, to the Pantheon of Death and their ordering of the Shadowlands, that is showcased in multiple locations. Ardenweald, it's the most straightforward one, as it outright states that the Winter Queen created the domain, meaning that it didn't exist at the beginning. The Nefrius has created the other Venvir in his image, meaning that they weren't there in the beginning. The Archon is the first of the winged Kyrians, meaning that more followed after. Only Maldrexus, it doesn't seem to have outright source behind the creation of its citizens or the realm. We do know that this is the birthplace of necromantic magic, and perhaps the disappearance of the Primus that could explain that lack of information. The Jailer is presumably referred to as the Banished One, and if we are looking for parallels, perhaps we should also look at how the Titans and the Keepers, how they locked away things that stood in their path or bring order to the world. The Old Gods, for example, they were imprisoned, while the Elemental Lords, they were sent off to the Elemental Plane, a plane of existence which was created by the Keepers. So could it be that the Ma was also molded and created to house their problems? That of course begs the question, what exactly did the Jailer do to deserve such a fate? And what methods did they use to contain him? The Jailer of the Damned. A grim...
task, which I have failed. Now the eternal veil screams, torn asunder by her. Within the realm of shadow lies the darkest of terrors, which should never be set free. The craftsmanship of the Primus has already been pointed out to have some similarities to artifacts that we've known in the past, even the Jailer himself. His disappearance might have very well been at the hand of the Jailer and his allies to make sure that the Helm of Domination cannot be reforged. Imagine a connection between the powers of the Lich King and the Jailer itself. This would give a whole different meaning to the line There must always be a Lich King. Not just to keep the Scourge on Azeroth in check, but to contain the Jailer in the Maw as well. Truly be a Jailer of the Dance. Does of course leave the question about the motivation to all of this. I personally would love to see a story in which we discover that the handiwork of this pantheon of death, creating a machine which generates anima from our souls, an arbiter that judges us and places us in different pockets of the Shadowlands, that all of that gets a morality check. Who are these mighty beings to judge the souls of the mortals? Who has given them the right to change the Shadowlands? To decide that one soul is irredeemable, one is really naughty, one is all about power, and oh that one, yeah, yeah just send them off to party with the angels. Learning that the Shadowlands as it is right now is not the way it's supposed to be. And that Sylvanas' motivations are in direction of setting us free. Break the wheel, the endless cycle, and free us from the tyranny of the pantheon of death so we can go to the real Shadowlands, as it was supposed to be. This world is a prison. That's what I will personally find a really interesting storyline. However, lines like, should this ancient evil chained here break free, all of reality will be consumed. And lines like, The denizens of this realm are the key to restoring the balance between life and death. If their trust can be earned has me think that it's more realistic that the Jailer truly is a prime evil that we need to contain or defeat. That we need to stop Sylvanas and those allied to the Jailer from setting him free. That still leaves the question for Sylvanas' motivation. For her, the afterlife was said to be a realm of eternal torment. Apparently her actions as the Banshee Queen to try and claim vengeance upon Arthas, it made it so that the Arbiter judged her to the maw. Unless, of course, the Jailer itself dragged her in there. Either way, torment was waiting for her. By allying with the Jailer, joining his covenant and obtaining power, she is on the path of setting him free. With no Jailer in the Ma, perhaps no Ma or Bastion or Ouroboros or nothing like this entire machine gone, there would be no more torment waiting for her when she dies. There would be no more torment for any of us. But yeah, like I said at the start, it's, it's a whole lot of speculation. And I can't wait for more of the story to be revealed. And I will set us all free. I do hope that you enjoyed the story so far. And if you're looking for more details on all the things that we talked about today, then check out the Delayed Wild article in the description down below. And by all means, let me know what you think down below in the comments, especially about Sylvanas' motivation or perhaps the motivation of the Shadowlands. I'm really intrigued about this machine of death because... There has to be a purpose to it, right? Like we know that the Pantheon, they brought order to Azeroth because they wanted to give the spirit inside the planet. They wanted to give her a fighting chance. So why exactly was it that the Pantheon of Death decided to bring order to the Shadowlands, create this whole machine where the souls belong? Is this just the way it's supposed to be? Or is there a much larger plan behind it? I am really curious to find out. But yeah, thank you very much for watching, everybody. You could all subscribe if you like my videos. Leave a like if you enjoyed this one. And until next time, see ya!